Here we go. It is that time of the day again, or that night, I suppose. All right. Um, so we've got a rather busy day ahead of us. We're going to go ahead and finish talking about um, tissues, finish histology. Um, we left off talking about connective tissues, and that's where we'll pick up. So just to do a quick uh, review. Um, oh, yes. Um, I'm not sure if it was last lecture or lecture before, but somebody asked a question about protein synthesis, and I, and I, um, I just remembered it for some reason, and um, I'm not sure if I, if I answered it uh, sufficiently, but the question was some, something on the lines of what, um, what tells the ribosomes when to start and stop coding for the, for the protein, and there are, um, there are actually what are called a codon in the strand of RNA as it gets fed into the, uh, the ribosome. And at the, toward the beginning, you have what are called start codons that say, okay, start coding. And then it starts making the polypeptides and eventually they become protein. And then toward the end of that sequence, you have what's called a stop codon that says, okay, stop coding. All right, protein's made. So you've got start and stop codons. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that, that question because I'm not sure if I answered it um, answered it the best way, or, or I, I think maybe I was thinking of, of, of something else, or I was <coughs> thinking of uh, the protein folding issue of how proteins fold versus the actual what what on the nucleic acid um, uh, starts and stops. So there you have it. Um, quick review. So we talked about epithelial, muscle, and nervous tissue last lecture. Um, so just re uh, remember epithelial tissue, we look at it based on layering and its shape. Um, layering really comes down to two, two concepts. Simple, which is just a single layer of cells, and then stratified multiple layers. Okay. And then shape, you have three basic shapes. You have your squamous, which are your, your flat cells with flattened nuclei. You have your cuboidal, and then you have your, your columnar, which are taller than they are wide. And then you have a couple of um, a couple of little guys that don't fit the the, the canon that we we've talked about, and that is your pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue and um, your transitional epithelial tissue, and those of course have uh, special uh, functions associated with them. Um, we talked about muscle. We talked about smooth cardiac and skeletal muscle, uh, and then we talked about nervous tissue as well. Uh, the neurons and the glial cells. Um, just a couple of things before we get into connective tissues. Um, just want to talk about a few disorders that come up, and I think at least one or two of these is mentioned in your book. Um, the first one is something known as Marfan syndrome, and it's these are all relatively rare disorder. Um, we do see Marfan syndrome. Um, I've I've seen it more. Um, I've never seen um, the other two. Um, in my career in healthcare, but I have seen people with Marfan syndrome. So they're pretty rare, Marfan syndrome, maybe a little more common. Um, so we have Marfan syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, and then fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva. progressiva. Um, so Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder where you um, have tissues that um, are, uh, for lack of better words, overly stretchy, and, and these people tend to have issues with joints or joint dislocations, and um, they tend to have problems with their blood vessels, specifically the connective tissue that holds the blood, plus blood vessels, large blood vessels, arteries in place, and uh, their general integrity, and these particular people are prone to developing aneurysms in dissections of their, their blood vessels. And um, <coughs> um, we've actually seen people, um, relatively healthy young people, even a couple of athletes have, have died from this. Um, they actually developed an aneurysm in one of their blood vessels, and that aneurysm ruptured. And of course, they bled out um, because you can get aneurysms in very critical areas of your body, such as where the aorta, that's the large vessel, comes off the top of the heart. It's called the aortic arch. And you can get 
uh, dissections there. You can get aneurysms along the aorta in your, your abdomen. We call those abdominal aortic aneurysms. And so people with Marfan syndrome are, are much more prone to developing these kinds of, of problems. And oftentimes you don't know that you necessarily have an aneurysm until it ruptures, causes problems. And at that point, it's, it's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty moribund situation. Um, osteogenesis imperfecta is, um, a, as you might guess, um, is a problem with bone, with making bone um, tissue. Um, your bones are very, quote unquote, brittle. These people are very prone to fractures, even just small little bumps, and minor trauma can cause major fractures. There is actually a movie, um, Unbreakable, um, where this is part of the plot, where the, the, uh, the bad guy, um, the super villain, uh, Mr. Glass or something like that, actually had this particular disorder and it was part of the plot of the movie. Um, and then uh, you have this fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva. And what this is, this is a really interesting disorder. It's terrible, though. Um, these people have a very, very short, very limited lifespan. And what happens is um, normally when you are involved in some sort of trauma, even minor trauma, you get a little bruise, right? You get bruising. And that, what is that bruising? Well, that's generally soft tissue, sometimes muscle tissue, um, bleeds, right? You get bleeds. Sometimes you'll get what's called a hematoma. And a hematoma is just a collection of blood. Anyone ever seen like a goose egg on the head? That's, that's what it is, a hematoma. Well, when you get these kinds of trauma where you get these bruising and hematomas, uh, which are very common, right? You can just bump into a desk or a chair or something and this will happen. Um, what happens in patients with this disease is um, that soft tissue, the area where you have those tissues, actually um, calcium comes in and that area becomes calcified. And so over time, as time goes on, as they, you know, little bumps and things like that, they start developing bone tissue or osseous tissue um, throughout their bodies in areas where it doesn't belong. And as you might imagine, the older you get, the more and more disabled these people become as they develop all these calcifications throughout their body. And, and eventually these people um, will go on, they won't be mobile, they'll end up in a wheelchair, they'll end up in bed, they'll, they'll, they're more prone to infections. Um, if this calcification occurs around the chest, which often it does, um, it can actually impair their, their ability to breathe. Um, if we go in and try to surgically remove the calcified tissue, that actually causes more calcified tissue to develop. So there is simply no way of, of really dealing with this. So. Um, pretty rare, but you know, the, it pretty pretty rough um, disease. People generally do not live beyond a few decades of life. So, and then with that in mind, I just wanted to kind of shoehorn uh, another little concept in, and that is a specific type of uh, category of genetic disorders called SNPs or SNPs, and that stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. And basically, what it is is it a mutation of one nucleotide, so it's a single nucleotide, okay, in, in a sequence, okay, you have, right, you have a sequence of nucleic acids that form a gene, well, it is a mutation of one of those nucleotides in that sequence, and there are a variety of diseases and disorders that result from just a mutation of that one nucleotide. Um, uh, some examples I threw up here, uh, a respiratory or pulmonary disorder called cystic fibrosis, where um, one nucleotide becomes mutated, and there is a kind of protein channel for chloride. It's a chloride channel that becomes mutated, and these people are born with an inability for this chloride channel to function, and they're not able to move chloride ions across cell membranes like they should, and this um, causes lots of problems when it comes to mucus. Their mucus becomes very, very hardened, very sticky, it tends to clog the lungs up, um, and it also causes problems with digestion as well, as far as absorbing nutrients and things like that. So, um, a pretty pretty rough disease. And as you might guess, these people do not have a very long lifespan. You're looking at three to four decades of life. Um, 
And then uh, sickle cell anemia, which is not particularly common around here, but it is much more common in um, areas of the country where there are more uh, people that have African heritage or African descent. Um, and this is a result of a single nucleotide polymorphism. And what happens is um, the red blood cells are, as you guys have seen, normally have a round, biconcave kind of appearance to them. What happens in sickle cell anemia is the hemoglobin, um, there, there, it's an abnormal form of hemoglobin that causes them to have a kind of a half moon shape or a sickle shape. And those red blood cells then tend to clump up and they tend to clog up um, tissues, uh, particularly of the vascular beds of tissues. And then this causes um, organs to become ischemic. And ischemic just means that they're oxygen deprived. And so that can make you prone to having your kidney shut down, your strokes in your brain, heart attacks, uh, other organs shutting down. And these people can go on to have sickle cell crises and, and uh, can be very painful if it involves their muscles or joints, um, so on and so forth. We don't see it commonly, it's not commonly encountered down here, but it is more common in, in areas of the country and world where um, uh, you have people that have um, African lineage. Um, the actual trait appears to, actually, appears to be an evolutionary um, advantage. It actually offers um, some evolutionary advantage to people. People that have the sickle cell trait um, and, and just because you have the trait doesn't necessarily mean you'll develop the disease. But people that have the trait and or disease are more resistant to the effects of malaria. And where do we see malaria? Yeah, we see it in areas of the world where people from that have African descent come from. Um, um, Africa, for example. Um, so it does seem that there is, a, a, there is an evolutionary a biological um, explanation for how this trait has um, um, been able to survive um, all the pressures applied to it. Okay, so I just wanted to throw that out. There are many, many other disorders. Um, I actually have a genetic disorder. It's, it's a relatively common genetic disorder. It's called uh, Gilbert's or Gilbert's syndrome. Um, and what it does is it, I, have a, it, I have a defective gene that codes for an enzyme that helps um, with something known as a conjugation reaction, where you attach a large molecule to another one and it helps your body get rid of it, um, the urine. And this particular disorder involves something called bilirubin. Um, I'm not able to um, get rid of bilirubin as effectively, and so my bilirubin levels tend, tend to be a little higher than normal, and um, um, that makes me more prone to developing jaundice. Otherwise, it's a fairly benign disorder, but um, that's just one more example. Uh, many, many different examples of SNPs. Okay, so let's move on and talk about connective tissues. So, connective tissues in general, okay, they all come from the same cells, right? That's what, that's what they all share. That's, the, that's what all these diverse groups, this diverse group of tissue shares that they come from. Um, an embryonic tissue, embryonic stem cell tissue known as mesenchyme, okay? And um, this primarily in the adult exists in the bone marrow. And we'll be talking about bones in more detail in the, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so the stem cells, this mesenchyme or this embryonic tissue, okay? The cells actually originate from there and then they become more specialized and they specialize out into the specific types of connective tissue, of which there are many, okay? Um, connective tissues have a prominent extracellular matrix, unlike the other tissues that we've talked about at this point, right? So the connective tissues are embedded within this matrix Okay, sometimes it's liquid, sometimes it's solid, and then this matrix can contain things like round substances and can contain different types of fibers, collagen fibers, reticular fibers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and the different types of matri matrices or, or matrix matrices are important for the different types of connective tissues. Okay, 
Um, and cells often exist within what are called lacunae. Okay, lacunae, um, which are little lake-like, little, little oval lake-like structures, okay, within the matrix. Okay, and this is particularly relevant when we look at cartilage. Um, and, and when we went through histology, of course, we were able to appreciate that in many of the cartilage slides that we looked at. Um, let's see, active cells, so cells that are actually secreting the matrix, because remember the extracellular matrix is created by the cells themselves. Um, what do we call those? Well, in general, those are known as blasts. Okay, so for example, an osteoblast would be a cell that is actively producing the extracellular matrix of bone. Right? Um, and then when they become inactive and they're not making extracellular matrix anymore, we call them sites. So an osteocyte would be um, a quote-unquote inactive osteoblast. You guys okay with that? You can have fibroblasts and fibrocytes and melanocytes and et cetera, et cetera, depending on the different types of tissue that we're talking about. They produce the extracellular matrix or the cells themselves? No, the cells. We're talking about naming the cells. And the cells, the, the cells are what produce the matrix. Yeah, the, yeah. So, for example, an osteoblast would be a bone cell or a type of bone cell that is producing the extracellular matrix of bone. Um, the uh, calcium hydroxy, hydroxy appetite. Um, and then once that, that, that blast kind of gets encapsulated and it, it's like, okay, I don't really need to do anything now, I'll just kind of chill out, then we'll call it an osteocyte. Okay. But you'll often hear people use those terms interchangeably. And in general, you, you can more or less use them interchangeably, but when you really look at the nuance to it, um, that's the difference between those. Okay. So now we're going to move on to talking about connective tissues. Um, connective tissues are found throughout the body. They're everywhere. And let's start broad. Okay, we have four broad types. Okay, so you have your connective tissue proper. Okay, this is the most widely distributed connective tissue. Okay, um, these are the fibroblast cells primarily. Um, the connective tissue brought proper has a pretty extensive extracellular matrix, lots of different protein fibers, and connective tissue proper is highly vascular. It has a very robust vascular supply. You guys okay with that? So what we're going to do is we're going to start at connective tissue proper. Okay, so it gets complicated. So there are four general types of connective tissues, right? You've got proper cartilage, bone, and blood, okay? And then under proper, you have six major types of proper that we need to talk about. So you can see how this stuff gets a little, little comp complicated, okay? So let's talk about the first type. That is the looser areolar connective tissue proper, okay? This consists primarily of that ground substance in its extracellular matrix. All three of the major protein fibers are present. Okay, you guys remember what the three major protein fibers are? Elastic. Elastic. Reticular. Collagen. And collagen. Got it. There you go. Elastic, reticular, and collagen. So all three of those fibers are present. Okay. And we primarily find this loose connective tissue in the basement membranes of hollow organs. Okay, so your intestines, your stomach, okay, those types of organs, or organs that have a hollow cavity with them in them, not necessarily solid organs like your liver. Okay. Solid organs like your liver tend to have this kind of connective tissue, which is the next type, the reticular. And this, as you might imagine, contains a lot of those fine, meshy reticular fibers. And it is very net-like. It looks like a net, and it supports this reticular um, tissue, connective tissue proper, is really good at supporting nerves and blood vessels. And so where you have areas where you've got lots of nerves and blood vessels going in and out of organs, you're going to see a lot of reticular um, connective tissue 
uh, i.e. like something like your liver, right, where you have lots of blood vessels coming in your liver and lots of things going on. Okay. Um, your adipose tissue, this is your fat, right? These are your fat cells, okay? Um, they contain primarily what? Triglycerides, right? And um, there you go, yeah. These are your adipocytes, okay? You guys okay so far? All right. So moving right along, we have your dense regular, okay, connective tissue. And this has a regular arrangement of collagen fibers, okay? So collagen fibers arranged in a, a regular arrangement with a little amount of ground substance. So the minimal amount of ground substance here Okay, so it's very dense, and as you might imagine, where are you going to have this stuff? Well, you're going to have this stuff where you have tendons and ligaments, so we are holding bones and muscles together. Um, even though we haven't done these, talked about um, articulations in the musculoskeletal system, something you want to throw in the back of your mind is ligaments. Okay, ligaments attach bones to bones, okay, and tendons attach muscle to bone. Okay, so you want to keep that in the back of your mind. Tendon, a tendon is a muscle to bone, a ligament is a bone to bone, and then there are injuries called sprains and strains. When you strain something, if somebody has a straining injury, that is an injury that either involves the muscle or the tendon. A sprain, like a sprained ankle, involves injury of the ligaments, okay? So that is an important differentiation there, even though we're not talking about that specifically today. And then you have this dense irregular, okay? Just like the dense regular, you have collagen fibers, but they're bundled up in an irregular arrangement. So you have these bundles of collagen fibers irregularly arranged throughout that tissue. And where do we see this? We see this in two important places. This makes up the joint capsules, okay, the capsules that surround our joints. And important for today, because we're going to be talking about the integumentary system, we see these in the dermis of the skin, okay. That's that second layer, okay, this dense, irregular um, connective tissue. And then finally, we have dense, elastic connective tissue proper. And as you might imagine, this probably contains a lot of elastic fibers. And so we see this in areas of the body where you have lots of stretchy stuff, stretchiness going on, specifically large blood vessels, right? Because your blood vessels, right, they can expand and they can collapse, right? Specifically like large arteries, like big arteries that come out of your heart, like your aorta as your heart beats, okay? You can have lots of stretching there. And so that's where we see a lot of this dense elastic connective tissue in your large blood vessels. And you do see it in some ligaments as well, but large blood vessels. You guys okay there? So that's connective tissue proper. Okay, so this is proper. What we mean by proper, basically, it just means that it properly holds stuff together and protects. Okay, some of the other types of tissue, connective tissue, aren't necessarily holding anything together. For example, cartilage. Okay, cartilage is the next type of connective tissue we're talking about. Okay. There are three major types of cartilage that you want to be aware of. And unlike connective tissue proper, which tends to be very vascular, cartilage, okay, even though I don't have it written on the board, it's something you want to throw on the back of your mind, cartilage tends to be highly avascular. Okay. This is why injuries to cartilage can be very tough to treat and deal with because they don't heal like we'd like them to as quickly as we'd like them to because they have this avascularity. So there are three types of cartilage that you need to be aware of. Okay, you have hyaline, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. We'll start at hyaline cartilage, and this is the easiest to identify because hyaline cartilage kind of has a translucent, glass-like appearance. Okay. So you have these chondrocytes that are surrounded by this almost translucent looking ground substance. It's very smooth appearing. And then dotted, embedded within that smooth appearing um, extracellular matrix, 
ground substance, you have the lacunae with the cells in them, and it's a very characteristic finding, and of course we got to look at this in lab. Um, we tend to find hyaline cartilage on the ends of bones, and you, find, you have hyaline cartilage wherever you have really smooth movement, where you need to have smooth, frictionless motion occurring. So this cartilage covers the ends of bones, okay? We do see a little bit of it in the nose, and we also see this in the tracheal and bronchial rings. So those little bumps on your trachea that you can feel, that's actually hyaline cartilage as well. And in the lab, when we did the histology lab, all the hyaline cartilage that we looked at was actually cartilage from um, tracheal rings of uh, small mammals, not, not necessarily humans, but small mammals. But you do have hyaline cartilage that lines the ends of your bones because generally your bones come together joint and you have motion. And so you want that smooth, frictionless cartilage um, to facilitate movement. Okay. That's hyaline cartilage. Okay. So its extracellular matrix is fairly translucent, so it doesn't have a whole lot of those fibers in it. However, fibrocartilage, as you might imagine, is going to have a lot of fibers in it. So unlike hyaline cartilage, um, fibrocartilage is going to have a very fibrous appearance to it when you look at it. It's going to have lots of collagen fibers. It's pretty tough stuff. And this is important because it reinforces <coughs> ligaments. Okay. And it also forms what are known as articular discs. Okay. We're not going to go into these in detail today, but we're going to get there. Articular discs are not, uh, some people mistake them for discs in the joints. Not necessarily. What these are, are these are discs that help improve the fit between certain bones and they separate different synovial cavities within the joint capsule, okay? So just to keep things separate here, articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is cartilage that covers the ends of bones and allows bones to articulate or move. That is not the same thing as an articular disc though, okay? Articular discs with this fibrocartilage in them, okay, are, are discs that actually kind of are in the joint that improve the fit between the bones, separate the, the cavities, but are not actually covering the ends of the bones. You guys, you guys cool with that? And in fact, when hyaline cartilage gets damaged, it may get replaced with fibrocartilage. So if you have damage to hyaline cartilage, damage to, you know, say, uh, um, the meniscus of your knee, for example, gets damaged, you may have fibrocartilage that replaces that. And as you might imagine, it's not going to be as smooth of motion of articulation occurring there. And then finally, we have elastic cartilage. And this contains a lot of, if you have your guess, a lot of elastic fibers. How about that? So it's really stretchy, but the elastic fibers are, not only can they stretch, but they're very good at returning back to their original shape. Okay, so elastic fibers, it can stretch, but it'll recoil to its original shape. And so we see this in two very specific areas of the body. Okay, this is primarily the cartilage of our ear. Okay, the external part of your ear. All right, right, I can pull this down and then I'll let go of it and barrel pops back up into its original shape. And we also see this in a little flap of tissue in your airway. And what happens is this little flap of tissue, anytime you swallow, anytime you swallow, this flap of tissue covers the trachea, the windpipe, and it prevents food from going down into your trachea and into your lungs whenever you swallow. And that is known as the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is moving quite a bit, right? There's some stretchiness there, and it needs to uh, maintain its shape. And so we see a lot of elastic cartilage um, in that epiglottis. You guys, you guys okay? So far, so far, so good. All right. Um, so this is this is really the hardest part, I think, are the connective tissue proper and the cartilage, just because there are so many different subtypes. So you want to, as you're studying. You want to be able to identify these, OK? 
okay? You want to be able to identify key features of them, so things that have underlined, and you want to be able to know uh, un or identify major areas of a body where these connective tissues are found. Does that, does that kind of make sense there? Okay, so identify their name, key characteristic features of them, and the major areas of a body where we find them. Okay, so we're good to go there. We're good to go there. All right, so we are tracking right along. All right, um, is it okay if I erase one of these? You guys, you guys got that okay? Okay. So next what we're going to talk about, and this will be fairly, fairly quick and easy to get through, we're going to talk about bone or osseous tissue. So tell me about bone, guys. What are, so, what are the characteristic features of bone when we look at the histology of bone? What kind of structure does it have when we look at it? So if you look at cartilage, for example, if I look at some hyaline cartilage, right? so I have a fairly translucent thing, and then embedded in this translucent thing, I have these, these lacunae with a cell or cells in them, right? So I see something like that. That's characteristic for hyaline cartilage. And then if you had a lot of fibers in it, okay, that might be something like fibrocartilage. cartilage. Right? What does bone look like, though, when we look at bone tissue, osseous tissue? Okay, so it does have some little tunnels in it. But how are they arranged, or how is it, what's the general arrangement of the tissue? And there's a very specific, yes, and there's a very specific term I'm looking for. Striated? Not striated, no, that's muscle, or uh, skeletal and cardiac muscle specifically. These are the lamellae. There you go. The lamellae are these concentric circular structures, okay? So you have these, these concentric kind of circular structures like this, the lamellae. And then you have within lacunae, okay, you have the cells. So you do have lacunae in this, in, in this osseous tissue as well. And then here in the center, this is, is what we call the central canal, and we'll talk about the the specific, uh, some more, more nuanced concepts um, next week. Um, but you have these lamellae, right? You have a pretty extensive extracellular matrix, but is an extracellular matrix kind of uh, gel-like and squishy like we'd see in cartilage? What is special about the extracellular matrix in osseous or bone tissue? Yeah, it contains, what is the, the substance it's primarily contained within that? There you go, calcium hydroxyapatite. Yeah, calcium hydroxyapatite. All right, so these are really tough, they're hard, and they're good at resisting mechanical stress, right? You guys, you guys cool with that? Okay, and that's really all we need to know about bone tissue, um, the major stuff as far as bone or osseous tissue. You have osteoblasts, osteocytes, and then you have a kind of cell known as an osteoclast. The blasts build the matrix, and the clasts break the matrix down. And we talked about this last week with bone remodeling and how bone can remodel itself in response to environmental changes. For example, if I pick up running or some sort of sport where I have impact on my bones, my bones will remodel themselves to accommodate that kind of, of mechanical stress that's, that's occurring. Okay, cool. Now let's go ahead and talk about um, the next category of connective tissues, and this is um, what I'm going to call blood. Um, I, I, your book may call it the, the, the liquid connective tissues. 
or fluid connective tissues because they flow. Um, there are really two types. There's blood and lymph. I'm not really going to talk about lymphatic tissue today. Um, you will go into that in, in, in greater detail when you talk about the immune system. But what happens is not only do you have fluid in your blood vessels, right? But you have fluid that surrounds the cells known as what? What is that fluid that surrounds the cells themselves? What's that? No. Well, extracellular fluid is a broad term that means anything outside of the cell. So that could include vascular uh, fluid as well. Is it that no, that's that's to do with the joints. Okay, the fluid in your joint capsules. This is known as interstitial fluid. We talked about this last week um, when I was talking about um, endocrine glands, right? Interstitial fluid. This is fluid that surrounds the cells. The cells themselves are bathed in this fluid. Okay, how does this fluid, if you get too much of this fluid, Okay, how does this fluid get put back into the vascular space? Well, the fluid becomes lymph, and it gets sucked up by lymphatic vessels, and then the lymphatic vessels take that fluid into lymph nodes, and then eventually that fluid gets dumped back into your circulatory system. So this lymphatic tissue, or this lymphatic fluid, um, contains a lot of proteins, it contains a lot of immune cells, and mainly water as well. Um, and this is a very important uh, component of our immune response. Specifically, it's an important component of something known as the inflammatory response. And I know that, that it, there, there is some reading on the inflammatory response in your book as well. But what happens with the inflammatory response is this is one of the initial things that occurs when you either have an infection or an injury. And what happens in, 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 in an infection or injury is your cells realize, oh, something's going on here. And your cells begin to release chemicals. Okay? And this process is known as chemotaxis, okay? chemical communication. And they release these chemicals, and these chemicals then activate what's known as the inflammatory response, where the temperature in that area increases. Why would the temperature increase? Well, you have more efficient metabolism occurring. Remember when we talked about chemical reactions, and they tend to occur more efficiently in higher temperatures, right? So the temperature in that injured or infected site increases. And what else? Well, we need to get blood into that area, right? We need to get oxygen into that damaged area. We need to get immune cells in there. How do we do that? Well, the vessels need, the blood vessels need to become leaky. Okay, there are little pores on the blood vessels need to open up. And that's something known as increased capillary permeability. The vessels become more permeable. So stuff can get out of them easier. They become leaky. All right, so white blood cells and other proteins can leak out of those cells and into that damaged area. So what happens, it begins to swell. So it swells, it gets hot, and of course, pain occurs as well, right? That's all part of the inflammatory process. But how, once the area's been stabilized and healing starts, how do we get all that fluid and all those cells and maybe all of those bacteria that maybe it's still wandering around? How do we get all that out of there? That is the lymphatic circulation that ultimately is involved in the resolution of that infl inflammation. You guys okay with that? Okay, what we're gonna focus on today is not the lymph, lymph fluid, even though I've talked about it in a little bit of detail, but we're gonna talk about the blood, okay? So, just like all the other types of connective tissue, you have an extensive extracellular matrix, okay? Primarily water. And what is the extracellular matrix called in, when, we, when we talk about blood tissue? Plasma. plasma. Now, this plasma is very important 
because blood plasma contains most of the proteins in your blood, well, the free-floating proteins, okay? Some of the proteins are very good at holding water in, okay? They produce osmotic pressure to hold water in. The most common protein involved in this is something known as albumin. And we see, and I believe there's a picture in your book, we see in some cases when your albumin levels get very low, water tends to leak out of your blood vessels. You tend to lose that osmotic pressure. And um, people that have liver disease, okay, um, where do you make a lot of your proteins? Or your liver, okay? And people with liver disease may have a very low protein level, and that will cause fluid to shift out of their blood vessels. And because their liver is failing, you get a backup of fluid as well. And that can cause some swelling in the abdomen, and that's known as ascites. Okay. So ascites is a part of the, the problem with ascites is, is low um, albumin levels. You have some other proteins that are important, clotting factors. You have protein clotting factors that help with blood clotting, forming clots so we don't bleed to death when we get injured. Another very important type of protein in your blood plasma is something known as an immunoglobulin. Okay? The other term for immunoglobulin is antibodies, or antibody rather, but antibodies. So you've got antibodies, you've got clotting factors, you've got albumin, Okay, so you have all these very important proteins in your plasma. And then you have these cells that are floating around the, that plasma or that matrix, okay? And you have a few general types of cells, okay? You have your red blood cells or your RBCs. You have your white blood cells or your WBCs. Okay. And then you have a very special type. It's not a cell. It is a cell fragment. Okay, so they're not proper cells. They're cell fragments known as platelets. Okay. And another term for a red blood cell is an erythrocyte. Erythrocyte. Okay. Cyte, of course, meaning cell. Okay. White blood cells, leuco, white, cyte. Okay. And then platelets are known as thrombocytes. So erythrocytes, leukocytes, thrombocytes, red blood cell, white blood cell, platelets. Okay, you guys cool with that? So far so good? All right, so um, let's talk about the erythrocytes. The erythrocytes, as we've talked about before, do not contain a nucleus. So guess what? They can't manufacture proteins, which means they have a very limited shelf life, right? About a month or so. They don't live very long because they can't make proteins. Okay. Their primary job is to do what? It's the primary job of an erythrocyte or red blood cell? Transport. Transport oxygen, right? And what is the protein within a red blood cell that does this? Hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin. Okay. And one molecule of hemoglobin can transport up to four molecules of oxygen. In hemoglobin, remember we talked about the macromolecules of life. We talked about protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Um, hemoglobin is a quaternary structure protein that contains four subunits right, that come together to make the whole protein. And it also contains a prosthetic group, a cofactor, um, known as iron. So it contains an iron atom. And it is actually this iron that sits within something known as a porphyrin ring. Okay, there's a porphyrin ring with nitrogens that surround the iron, and the oxygen actually bonds to the iron in the hemoglobin. 
in the heme group. Okay, so that's that's red blood cell. That's what we need to know at this point. Okay, so um, these red blood cells don't really contain organelles. So what, in addition to protein synthesis, what do they not produce? Say it again. Yeah, they don't have yeah, they don't have any of that. But they don't contain mitochondria either. So yeah, they cannot produce a whole lot of ATP. And in fact, all the energy that red blood cells need comes from what? You had to guess. We talked about this last week, right? The three way the the three cycles that go into cellular respiration, two of them within the mitochondria, one of them um, on the inside of the cell membrane. Glucose. Well, as glucose comes in, well, that's not an energy production cycle. Remember, we have three cycles, two, two within the, the mitochondria, right? So you've got the Krebs cycle, with the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, uh, or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, all three are acceptable. That's one of them. And then you have the electron transport or oxidative phosphorylation is the other one. But there's a third one, right? And this one is completely anaerobic. It is completely anaerobic. It does not need oxygen, but it doesn't produce a whole lot of ATP. It produces four molecules of ATP, but two molecules are used to to drive it. What is that called? Glycolysis. Glycolysis. Right? Glycolysis. And that's why some people call it anaerobic glycolysis, right? Okay, so red blood cells get their ATP from glycolysis. They don't do a whole lot other than transport oxygen. So they don't need to have sophisticated machinery within their sophisticated organelles. Okay, let's now talk about the white blood cells. And this is a bit more nuanced. So you have five general types of white blood cells. And I just remember the saying, never let monkeys eat bananas. And I, does it even say that in the textbook? Mm -hmm. Does it give you that little, little pearl? That's, that's where I learned that from when I took anatomy and physiology back in like 97, I think, 96 or 97. I first took AP. It was a, it was a while ago. <laughs> um, but so you have neutrophils. Okay, so these are all white, white blood cell type, subtypes. You have neutrophils, you have lymphocytes, you have monocytes, you have eosinophils, and then you have basophils. So these are the five types of white blood cells, okay? And we also have a, a broad subtype of these known as a granulocyte and an agranulocyte. Granulocytes, when we look at a granulocyte, a white blood cell, okay, if you look at it under the microscope, okay, you're going to see something like this, and then you're going to see... The nucleus and the nucleus can it can it can be like a little horseshoe shape or it can you can be several different blobs but embedded within that you have these little granule structures okay and of course those are lysosomes right those are little sacs that contain enzymes within them and they use those enzymes to destroy pathogenic organisms right so the granulocytes tend to be phagocytic. They phagocytize, they eat, and they engulf like a bacteria, and then they dump their little granules of enzymes onto that bacteria, kill it, dissolve it, etc. cetera, okay? So um, what are the major granulocytes? Well, your neutrophils are granulocytes. So I'll just put a G there. Your lymphocytes are agranulocytes. Your monocytes are agranulocytes, your eosinophils are granulocytes, and your basophils are granulocytes. Okay? 
So neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils are all granulocytes. They all have a granular, they have those lysosomes in them. Um, the lymphocytes and monocytes are not. You guys good with that so far? So um, what do neutrophils do in general? Okay. Well, they're phagocytic, first of all. They're phagocytic. Okay, so they're really good at eating stuff. And um, neutrophils are interesting because they have two different forms. You have a mature form, and you have an immature. And what happens with neutrophils is the nucleus, an immature neutrophil nucleus kind of looks like this, okay. or it's just kind of a single single nucleus, and then as they become more mature, the, the nucleus kind of segments out a little bit, okay? So you have uh, these immature cells, uh, which are known as banded neutrophils, your bands, okay? And then your mature neutrophils are known as your segments. This is important in medicine because when when we're looking at somebody who may have an infection, we'll, we're going to run a test known as a CBC. It's a common test that we run on anybody that we're worried about that may have an infection. And, and many other things. CBC stands for complete blood count. And the CBC tells us how many red blood cells they have, how many white blood cells they have, um, and then we can even do what's called a differential, where we look at the different breakdown of the white blood cells. You know, what percentage are neutrophils, lymphocytes? And what we do is, as we're working somebody up with a possible infection, let's say that their neutrophils are elevated. So if their neutrophils are elevated, okay, and I haven't said this yet, but neutrophils are very important when it comes to fighting bacteria. Okay, so our neutrophils tend to elevate when we have bacterial infections. Okay. You guys okay with that? All right. And the medical term that means an elevation in your white blood cells in general, okay, is known as leuco cytosis leukocytosis so if I run a CBC and I see that my white blood count is elevated I have leukocytosis then what we do is we go looking and we go okay which one of these white blood cells is elevated which one of these is accounting for that overall elevation if it's your neutrophils that often points to a bacterial problem and then you have to ask yourself, well, are my segmented neutrophils or are my banded neutrophils elevated? And the way that I remember this is the body is, is um, basically when it's under an acute attack. So something happened, acute means sudden, quick, okay? An acute bacterial infection in the, in the, in the initial stages of an infection, the body's going to be like, women and children to the front lines, okay? I'm sending all the kids out to fight because we need to get this infection under control. So in an acute bacterial infection, you tend to see your immature neutrophils become elevated in your bands. And then in a more chronic infection, infection that's been going on for a longer time, where the body has had time to mature the neutrophils, we'll see the segments increase, okay? And um, the term for a common term for an elevated bands is known as a left shift. Okay, so if you're in the hospital and, and, and the doctor hands you, she hands you the, the lab slip and says, uh, we have leukocytosis with a left shift, you should be able to know, oh, okay, so the neutrophils are elevated, specifically the banded neutrophils are immature that points towards an acute bacterial infection versus a chronic. You guys, you guys cool with that? It kind of makes sense? All right, so there you go, a little lab 
Lab 101. Um, your lymphocytes are agranulocytes, and these are important when it comes to antigen antibody responses. Okay, I'm not going to go into, into that in any more detail because you will go into that in a lot more detail in, in the immune system. Okay, um, your monocytes are also agranular. Okay, these are phagocytic though. And the interesting thing about monocytes is they are they can leave the blood vessels very easily. And when monocytes leave the blood vessels, they become macrophage. So a macrophage is a monocyte that has left the blood vessel and it's gone into the tissue. And lots of different types of tissues and organs have these macrophage. For example, your lungs. You have alveolar macrophage. Um, you also see this in the inflammatory response where the, the monocytes are leaving. Okay, and these macrophage are really good at cleaning up the mess that's left behind. So you have dead or dying cells and, and you have all this messy stuff going on. The macrophage come in, they kind of eat that up and they clean that area up. Your eosinophils and your basophils are important in the <coughs> inflammatory response. These particular white blood cells are really good at releasing inflammatory inflammatory chemicals. Okay, so things like histamine. Right. Histamine is a, is a big one. They actually have special cells within, um, within certain tissues called mast cells that are really good at releasing lots of histamine. Um, another type of uh, TNF alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha is another type of inflammatory mediator. Um, there are a whole laundry list of them that you don't have to memorize here. You guys okay with that? So far so good? All right. Um, the medical term for low white blood count is leukopenia. So penia means a low number of cells, cytosis means a high number of cells. And you can also have erythrocytosis and erythropenia, high erythrocytes, low erythrocytes. And you can have thrombocytosis, too many platelets, and thrombopenia, too few platelets. And sometimes if somebody's really sick, or maybe they've, uh, they've received a lot of chemo, uh, cancer chemotherapy or a lot of radiation, you may see all of their blood cells low. And what's it, a word that means everything or all? Pan. Pan means all or everything, and that is pancytopenia. Pancytopenia means low levels of all of your blood cells. Okay, that's all that we're going to go into any, any sort of detail here. Um, I will say that when it comes to aller allergic reactions and a severe type of life-threatening allergic reaction known as anaphylaxis, the eosinophils and the basophils are going to be very, very important. In fact, have, have any of you seen somebody cough up a lot of sputum from their lungs and it has a very yellowish color? You've heard that or seen that? You will if you're going into healthcare. Yellow sputum, that yellow, is often caused by eosinophils moving in there. Um, and that indicates that there's a lot of inflammation. So if they're coughing up yellow sputum, that means that something is causing a lot of inflammation in their lungs. It may be an infection, it may be some sort of inflammatory disease like an asthma attack or a bad allergic reaction or, or some sort of chronic lung disease, something called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. Um, and then interestingly enough, these are also important when it comes to fighting parasites off too. They can become elevated certain parasitic infections. 
Okay, um, tell you guys what. Um, we have gotten through histology. Let me make sure. Yes, yes. Oh, how nice. We've gotten all the way through histology. So, how about you guys take a good 10 minute break and we will start on the integumentary system when we get back.